So my name is Katrina Dean, latterly of the University of Melbourne Archives, currently of Cambridge University Library and the editor of Archives and Manuscripts Journal. And it's great pleasure for me to be able to introduce this uh, session, Liberating Hidden Histories. One of the fantastic things about uh, working at University of Melbourne Archives was really the insight it gave into the relationship between the university and the community in Melbourne and Victoria and the way that the archive spoke to those questions. And I think that will really come out in some of the presentations today. So we're going to go in a different order um, in the panel. We're going to start out um, with Jean Taylor. Jean is a radical lesbian feminist activist and is the author of uh, three books about the Victorians' women's liberation and lesbian feminist archive, of which she is a founder, back in the 1980s, uh, and which is now in the University of Melbourne Archives. And Jean has been a long-term volunteer uh, at the archives as well. She's the author of uh, three books based on this work, Brazen Hussies, uh, Strip Stroppy Dykes, and Lesbians Ignite. And uh, I'll... Without further ado, Jean will come and speak to us. Um, uh, I too want to acknowledge the uh, Wurundjeri people of the Wurrung language group of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of, of the land that we're meeting on here today. I pay tribute to the elders past and present and to those who died in defence of their land and their culture and their way of life. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to the Aborig Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. I particularly also want to pay tribute to two Aboriginal women. Most, is, most of us have heard of the T Tasmanian Aboriginal woman, Truganini. Not so well known is that after she and her companions arrived in Melbourne in 1839, they were abandoned by the chief protector of Aborigines, George Robinson, and joined the armed resistance here in Victoria. After Truganini and four of her friends were arrested and put on trial for the murder of two sealers in Western Port Bay. The two Tasmanian Aboriginal men were the first people to be hanged in Melbourne in 1842. Truganini, Fanny and Matilda were deported back to Tasmania, where in the last years of her life, living in Hobart, Truganini became famous. Most people have heard about William Barrack, who was the Narangita and spokesperson of the Wurrung people. Barrack's sister, Annie Barrett, is not so well known. Annie mar married Andrew, a Gunai Kurnai man, and they had a son, Robert Wandon. Annie Barrett and her family were forced to move from Gippsland to Corrandirk in 1863, where her children and grandchildren were born and raised. Annie Barrett is the direct ancestor of all the Wurundjeri people alive today. I want to dedicate this paper about the Victorian Women's Liberation and Lesbian Feminist Archives to Sarah Elkis, who was a member of the VWLLFA from early 2000 until Sarah died in March 2017, this year. Sarah was not only an active member of Women's Liberation Switchboard, which is a phone information referral centre, and Women Against Rape during the 1980s, in, but into the 90s, she was a founding and contributing member of the Matrix Guild for Lesbians Over 40, the Jewish Lesbian Group of Victoria, and the Performing Older Women's Circus for Women Over 40, till she died. Sarah is just one example of the dedication of lesbian feminists to the principles and practice of the women's liberation movement and social justice here in Victoria, and followed that through by ensuring that our historical documents were preserved for posterity. Women in Victoria have a long and honourable history of radical activism. To mention just two major actions from the past. The Queen Victoria Women's Hospital was set up by women doctors in 1896 to enable them to practise medicine with women patients in a hospital setting. Because the patriarchy being what it is, women doctors were not allowed to work in hospitals, including the women's hospital. The first organisation in Australia to fight for votes for women was the Victorian Women's Suffrage Society, established in 1884, which helped organise the monster petition with over 30,000 signatures. But again, the entrenched sex sexism of the male politicians meant that Victoria was the last state to give women the vote in 1908. Just 
to show what, what women have been up against over these last couple of decades, last couple of centuries. Fast forward to the late 1960s, where it appeared, judging by the reports that were broadcast from the US in, in 1968 about women protesting at an anti Miss Victoria pageant and who had supposedly burnt their bras to demonstrate their point about women's oppression, that a revolution had started. After years of continual harassment by the police, the Stonewall Rebellion by lesbians, gays and trans in New York in June 69 was the very radical be beginning of the lesbian and gay liberation movements. The revolution for lesbians and women caught on here in Victoria. In May 69, Justice Minhennet ruled that if an accused doctor believed it was necessary to pr procure an, abort an abortion in order to, quote, preserve the woman from serious danger to her life or her physical and mental health, uh, end of quote, then under these particular circumstances an abortion was not deemed to be unlawful, thereby making abortions legal for the first time. This was fairly recently, 1969. Conditions for single mothers were so demoralising in that many were forced to relinquish their children for adoption that the Council for the Single Mother and Her Child was set up in 1969. CSMC was ultimately successful in pressuring the government to introduce the first single mother's pension in 1973. The first lesbian group in Australia, Daughters of Belitas, named after and affiliated with Daughters of Belitas in the US, which was established in 1955, was set up in Melbourne in 1969 to organise around the rights of lesbians. By early 1970, DOB advertised their PO box number, put ads in the age, and Francesca Curtis was interviewed on the Bailey file on TV by Tanya Halesworth. DOB changed its name to the Australasian Lesbian Movement in July 1970. After years of fighting for equal pay for women, a decision was handed down by the Arbitration Commission in June 69 to the effect that 10% of female workers covered by federal awards in a variety of occupations in Victoria were entitled to equal pay for equal work. Incensed by this paltry decision, in October 69, Zelda de Prado and several women supporters made their way to the Commonwealth Building in La Trobe Street, where one end of a chain was quickly padlocked to the door handles and the other end padlocked around Zelda's waist. Ten days later, there were three women, Thelma Solomon, Alva Gecki and Zelda, who chained themselves to the doors of the arbitration court to continue protesting about equal pay. In this way, the women's liberation movement began in Victoria to address the injustices towards women. In 1970, the Women's Action Committee was set up by Zelda, Thelma, Alva and Bon Hull, and WAC organised several su successful actions, like the equal pay tram rides, where these women only paid a fraction of the fare to demonstrate that they'd got a fraction of the wage to, to, to publicise their cause. Women's liberation area groups proliferated the Action for Adequate Childcare was established. The first National Women's Liberation Movement Conference was organised and Germaine Greer's The Female Unit was published. By 71, CAMP, Campaign Against Moral Persecution, and dozens of consciousness-raising groups by and for women were set up in Melbourne. 1972 was the year when the Women's Liberation Movement came into its own in Victoria. Germaine Greer visited the Child Care Action Group the Women's Electoral Lobby, the Gay Liberation Front, the Children's Book Group, Women's Prison Action Group, Equal Pay Committee, Women's Abortion Action Campaign and the Working Women's Coalition were set up. International Women's Day saw over 3,000 women take to the streets. The Women's Liberation Centre was established as a meeting place for the Women's Liberation Movement groups at 16 Little Latrobe Street. Betty Can Jump was performed by women at the Pram Factory. Weekend conferences were held at Sorrento. Women's Liberation Newsweb and Vashti's Voice were published on a regular basis and ZAP actions were organised. At the same time, the Aboriginal Tent Embassy was established in Canberra and the Victorian Nindathana Theatre and the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service were set up in Melbourne. Sorry. 19th, now where was I? I was a married mother of two and a mature age first year student at La Trobe Uni in 1972. By the time I left my first meeting with the Brunswick Consciousness Raising Group towards the end of that year, 
I was already politicised. My marriage broke up within weeks and I was more than ready and willing to engage with the radical politics of the women's liberation movement. I could go on and on naming all of the women's liberation groups, conferences, publications and actions that took place in Victoria over the next couple of decades. But just to mention a few, Women Against Rape was set up in 1973, as was the Radical Lesbians who organised the first Radical Lesbian Conference in Sorrento and the first Women Only Dances and helped establish Amazon Acres in New South Wales in 1974, about 3,000 acres owned by women in New South Wales. Also in 1974, the Women's Theatre Group devised, wrote and performed their own plays. The first Melbourne Women's Health Clinic provided a radical alternative for women's health needs. And the first Women's Refuge in Victoria, Women's Liberation Halfway House, provided a safe and supportive refuge for women and children fleeing domestic violence. In other words, it was lesbians and radical feminists who by 1974 had set up activist collectives and took radical actions around abortion, rape, domestic violence and lesbianism to bring these significant issues to public attention and show just how badly they impacted on women and then demonstrated by setting up women's refuges and rape crisis centres how women needed to be protective, protected from oppressive and brutal male behaviour. So this isn't a new conversation, it's been going for decades. They were exciting and heady times in the 1970s. <clears throat> we thought we were changing the world and it was only a matter of time before everyone caught on, realised what a mess the world was in under patriarchy and started adopting feminist ideology and putting it into practice. Another fast forward to 1982. The women's liberation movement as established by radical lesbian feminist, radical feminist and socialist feminist activism had been going for about 13 years when four activists, Vig Geddes, Sue Jackson, Mark Jacobs and Barb Friday <coughs> formed a reading and discussion group in 1982 based on early women's liberation publications. It wasn't long before they realised that some of the periodicals and conference papers were already hard to come by. This didn't augur well for future reference if they didn't immediately do something about the material that was still left. As a result, the group refocused its direction and purpose and decided to establish a women's liberation archive to ensure that our precious women's liberation material was saved for posterity. There was already a precedence. Gay, Australian Gay Archives, as it was called then, the word lesbian was added in 1990, had been set up in 78 to collect and preserve any and all material relating to the lesbian and gay communities in Australia. However, the Women's Liberation Archives had a slightly different and more politically oriented focus. It was out of this concern to safeguard our women's liberation movement history, arguably one of the most important revolutionary movements of the 20th century that the Women's Liberation Archives was founded. The first recorded meeting was held on the 1st of March 1983 in Fairfield with the four activists, Fidge, Jackson, Marg and Barb in attendance. The items on the agenda included opening a cheque account, working out a collection policy and one of the abiding concerns of any archives group to find a place to house this unique collection. By the sixth meeting, it was agreed that the aims of the archives group were to collect, catalogue, make accessible, house, produce, raise, increase awareness about and hold in trust all of the women's liberation material in Victoria from 1969 onwards. The, the women's liberation archives group made con contact with other radical feminist activists and feminist groups to acquire additional material and to attract members. They wrote articles to spread the word about what they intended doing and organised a raffle which raised $700. Out of concern that they wanted this material and information about the women's liberation movement to be available to others, they did some research into some of the issues and actions of the first three years of the women's liberation movement in Victoria, 69 to 72, and produced in conjunction with the very first feminist offset printing press, Sibylla Press, a calendar for 1984, which was sold for $1.50. The archives group had been going for a year when I joined in March 1984. The group was receiving more and more donations and material from activist feminists, and the need for space to store all the material was becoming critical. Again with Sibylla Press, we published another calendar for 85, which featured equal pay, films, IWG, refuges, rape, health, periodicals, conferences, women's studies, and housing during the years 74 to 75. 
as I was also volunteering at the Women's Liberation Switchboard based at the Women's Liberation Building in West Melbourne, I was aware that the Melbourne Women's Liberation Newsletter had stopped production and that their large upstairs room at the Women's Liberation Building had been abandoned and would be an ideal location for the archives. We moved into the room in November 85, thereby, thereby establishing a mutually agreeable connection with the other ar activist collectives in the building that was to last for almost seven years. Almost immediately, I began to archive the material in the donations already to hand and to sort them into some semblance of order. We decided to maintain all the collections under the name of the individual donor or the name of the, archive, or the, or the, name of the collective, often defunct. For the next few years, the archives received a great deal of material from lesbian and feminist activists. And being in the Women's Liberation Building, we were in the perfect position to also pick up on the material left behind by our defunct collectives, including all the material from Women Against Rape and the Newsletter Collective. When the halfway, Women's Liberation Halfway House Collective asked us to archive and store their sensitive material in 1987, it was agreed that their files would be more securely stored in the spare room in my house rather than the building. We produced a third calendar with Sibylla Press for the following year, featuring the years 76 and 77, and we still have spare copies, and I can give those away at the end of the session if you're interested. By way of working on Women's Liberation Switch board all the archives, I was on hand in the building to enable students to have access to the archives room for research. Eventually, and despite our regular fundraisers, we could no longer afford the building in Victoria Street. And by no mid-November 88, the archives moved into the small back room in the new Women's Liberation Building, Gertrude Street, Fitzroy, which was diagonally opposite the Shrew Women's Bookshop. All the co collectives combined to organise the Women's Summer Ball in December at the San Remo Ballroom, very big affair, which successfully raised enough money to cover all the Women's Liberation Building's expenses for the following year. For the next three years, the archives continued receiving donations, made the collection accessible for students, and along with the other collectives, helped to organise the, women, the Women's Summer and the Women's Winter Balls twice a year to keep the Women's Liberation Building open and accessible. Unfortunately, due to lack of interest and dwindling finances, the building closed down in June 1992. At that point, with, with nowhere else to go, uh, almost 100 donations moved into my house on a temporary basis, where they were stored in two rooms for the next eight years. <laughs> I decided, as I was the last member of the collective still standing, to add the word lesbian to the title, making it the Women's Liberation and Lesbian Archives. The reason I did this was to pay tribute to all the lesbian feminists who had played an integral part in the Women's Liberation Movement. During the 70s and 80s, whether it, was a, whether it was activist collectives or demonstrations, you name it, one lesbian or a dozen were actively engaged and influential in whatever needed doing. And of course, let's not forget the impact that lesbian specific groups like Radical Lesbians, Lesbian Action Group and the Lesbian Mothers Bridge the Gap Forum had on women's liberation movement politics, culminating in a plethora of lesbian festivals and conferences in every state during the 1990s and into the new millennium. Uh, in fact, the Sydney Festival actually booked out the Sydney Opera House for a lesbian concert there, which was fantastic, in uh, 1991. The common belief that the women's liberation movement were mainly, was mainly made up of middle class women was simply not true here in Victoria. In my experience, the women's liberation movement in Victoria was a predominantly working class, radical lesbian feminist, socialist feminist, revolutionary movement, which prided itself on making lesbian and women's voices heard and demanded that our rights were recognised. When I studied the list of contributors recently, out of the 156 contrib contributions we have to date, 78 of uh, those are from lesbians I know personally, from working with them um, in, the, in the movement. And there were 58 groups that, that were either lesbian groups or had lesbian members. By its very presence, the VWLFA recognises and pays tribute to the enormous contribution that lesbian activists have made to the women's liberation movement as a whole here in Victoria. On the other hand, during the 70s and 80s, we feminist act activists in Victoria did not have a good track record as far as feminist anti-racism work was concerned. 
Pat O'Shane, the first Aborigine to qualify as a lawyer, had this to say about the women's liberation movement in Refractory Girl in September 1976. Quote, the problem of racism is one that all women in the women's movement must start to come to terms with. There is no doubt in my mind that racism, racism is expressed by women in the movement. Its roots are many and they go deep. deep. Since then, we non-Aboriginal feminists have become slightly less ignorant and a tad more aware, as is evidenced by, by more recent donations to the VWLLFA, such as the Aboriginal Rights Solidarity Group papers and the Koori Heritage Trust, some of their documents. During those eight years, the archives were at my place. It was even easier for me to work on the archives and keep it accessible for research by PhD students and for writing books like Getting Equal by Marilyn Lake. However, after I'd been to see the Lesbian Her Story archives in Brooklyn during a visit to New York in the US in 1999, I returned to Melbourne inspired. I called a meeting and during the year 2000, a dedicated group of lesbians worked on incorporating the archives with a change of name to the Victorian Women's Liberation and Lesbian Feminist Archives and we decided to move the collection to the University of Melbourne archives where they have been stored ever since. Having the VWLLFA at UMA has proved to be a fruitful collaboration. Not only is this precious material being safely stored in temperature control conditions, but the VWLLFA still maintains a custodian role. New donations are still being received, old ones are being added to, and the ongoing archival work of sorting new donations, applying for grants to buy acid-free materials, photographing and archiving T-shirts, banners and badges, listing the material for online access, organising the lesbian and feminist periodicals to be bound, indexing photos, storing posters and memorabilia, including, this is the textile memorabilia, uh, clown costume from the Performing Old Women's Circus, items from the Coburn Sound Action in WA in 84, and a Radcliffe Runners softball outfit. <laughs> this all, all continues to be done by the VWLLFA volunteers. Even so, I no longer have to be on hand to make sure a student can access the collection because it can be accessed for research during business hours through the special collections reading room at the Bailey Library, a very convenient arrangement. We are also very appreciative of UMA's IT expertise and the effort the workers at UMA have gone to to ensure that appropriate items from our collection are, are included in various UMA exhibitions. And I have particularly enjoyed the friendly discussions over a cuppa in the tea room. I'm very grateful to the women's liberation movement because it saved my life by giving me a political purpose, a feminist framework and a radical lesbian community of like-minded and political oriented lesbians to keep me active and sane. And not least my longest relationship, 34 years and counting with the VWLLFA that documents almost 50 years of Victoria's small part in one of the most significant and political movements for revolutionary change the world has ever seen. Thank you. We've got a few minutes now where we can have questions or comments. So um, if you've got questions or comments for Jean, a, a, a microphone will come to you. Hi, Jean, it's Fiona. Um, I'm just wondering where you garnered your archival expertise. Was it, did you have any before you started? Was uh, it in the collective or did you collective, learn no. it as you went along? No. I uh, just did it as I went along. One of the things about being in the women's liberation movement was if you had an idea, uh, nobody was going to stop you following through. So I learned uh, all of my archiving just by doing the hands-on work, doing a bit of reading, uh, uh, that sort of stuff, and hearing from others how they, they did their archiving. The same with my publishing of my books. You know, the, the, uh, I, th I think that was one of the great things about the women's liberation movement in the 70s and 80s in particular, um, there was an encouragement. If you're a woman, you could do anything. And if you wanted to do anything, you're allowed to do it. Nobody said no. In fact, if you put up your hand at a, I well, didn't have to put up your hand, but if you're in a collective <laughs> meeting and said, you know, oh, what about such and such? I think we should have posters for the ball. Someone would immediately say, right, you're, <laughs> you want posters, you do it. You know, that sort of stuff. So there was a, and we, and we did learn. We learned on the, on the job and we could, uh, uh, it was a very invigorating and, and um, a dynamic time, especially coming from the 50s and 60s where women were not supposed to do anything. So, yeah. I just want to say thanks. That was a really outstanding talk, Jean. Really, really inspiring. 
And I wondered if you've got any comments to make. Vern Harris was saying this morning he doesn't feel any hope. He feels faith or something. And I wondered if you feel hope, um, you know, given your own life story and the work you're doing. And um, so I'm, this question's really about women's liberation, I guess. Yes, I was just talking to somebody about hope before. I'm not a big believer in hope myself, so I was interested in here, but then I'm not in faith either. So um, what, what I think we need to do, if we want a particular future, we have to live it now. If we're not doing today where we want us to be tomorrow, uh, we won't have a tomorrow. So we have to live, and I think that was the other thing about the Women's Liberation Movement. It wasn't a matter of going to meetings and then going home and doing what the hell you liked. You had to live out your politics. And um, but everybody was very fierce about that. You had to be, uh, if you were a women's liberationist and you were uh, a political activist, you had to also be living and doing what, how you wanted the revolution to be. And we made mistakes, of course, and we weren't always perfect. But uh, we tried to be as ideologically sound, <laughs> very big uh, thing in those days, as we could possibly be, but in the moment, in the day. Oh, hi, Jean. Thank you so much. Um, my name's Edwina Howe. Um, I hear you talking about handing over that custodian role to the University of Melbourne mm -hmm. Archives and how, um, you know, how important it is that you have trust in them mm -hmm. um, and what a massive process that actually is. Um, oh, what's my question? I, my, my question is uh, that there's a vital role to be played by that custodian in um, handing over the information in a story, her story form, um, and in that the establishment of relationships in terms of mentoring people mm. about the history um, and reinvigorating movements. And I understand um, when you've spent a lot of time of your entire life invigorating that movement, there's a time when you need to hand on mm. that, you know, that role. Um, I just wonder, do you, can you see universities having a role in that, um, in the sense of, is the archive informing teaching mm -hmm. in a, you know, in a real way? Mm -hmm. um, how do we kind of recreate the human or something in that? I don't know what my question is. I'm sorry. <laughs> Lots of thoughts. <laughs> I have to say that when, uh, when we realised that we could no longer house our collection... Now, I'd been working on the archives and a lot of it on my own for, for many, many years. Those archives hadn't even been touched by anybody else but women. It was in the Women's Liberation Building, it was being researched and accessed by women. In fact, we had a women-only policy in a lot of our collectives through the 70s and 80s. And so when it came to the stage that we realised that we couldn't afford to do anything. We couldn't afford a building ourselves, we couldn't afford to keep them uh, exclusively for our own use. And also, uh, so it, it was f for me very personally painful to hand over the archives to the, to the UMA, but there was no other thing to do. And we have built, managed to build up um, gradually, gradually over the years, a little bit more of an understanding of where we what the archive's about and what they can give to us. So it's, um, and that's where the tea room, I thought, came in very handy because it meant we got to know the workers. They got to know us. We could talk about what was actually happening. And I think that's part of the thing about um, if we're going to be anywhere, there has to be a personal connection. Um, you know, we, we didn't just hand it over. And they were very uh, encouraging for us to be part of it and still have a custodian role and still have a hands-on role, which was extremely important for us as activists, that we weren't just handing over the material holus bolus and never seeing it again. So I think that, uh, I think with UMA it has been a particularly good collaboration in that sense, you know, and, and we're all still learning, you know, and... Um, uh, but I think that it can work if you're going to, but you have to be a bit more personal about it than just, you know, they're the, that's the institution there and where the, you know, the grassroots activists, there has to be some sort of uh, more conversation as they've been talking about. <laughs> I think, um, uh, yep. just in the interest of time, thank you very much, thank you. Jane. Uh, next up we have um, Graham Willett and Cathy Sport.
Uh, Graham is a, an honorary fellow of the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies here at the University of Melbourne and is a committee member of the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives, here, also here in Melbourne. And Cathy Sport is a, a volunteer and a member of the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives. And they'll be speaking today about town and gown, um, LGBTIQ histories in the University of Melbourne Archives. Um, okay, so my name is Graham Willis, and I am one of the two of us who were involved in uh, a project which we came to call Town and Gown, uh, a reference to the way in which um, the, the, the relationship between the university and the wider community has often been characterised as kind of interactive, um, and that was something I wanted to, to take up. I want to begin by adding my acknowledgement to the traditional owners of the land of Nan, on which we meet today. Um, and to recognise the historic and ongoing injustices that underpin our presence here. The project Town and Gown came out of a grant by the Melbourne University, uh, Melbourne University called Melbourne Engagement Grant Scheme. And it was intended to, in lots of different ways, to give people an opportunity to apply for money in order to draw attention to the ways in which the university and its people can serve the, and have served the wider community. Uh, in my case, the project was about highlighting the role of the university community in leading public conversations around homosexuality over the past 50 years and its contribution to the development of laws and public policy. So it's the relationship between the community and the university via this particular issue. My own interest in that came out of the fact that since at least the late 70s I've been interested in the history of lesbian and gay Australia, uh, especially the political period beginning in 1969. Um, I had a kind of amateur interest in that for a long time. I came back to uni in 94 to do my PhD to research that history, uh, published and then in what I now realise was a complete miracle, got a job here at Melbourne University. Um, and alongside teaching Australian studies, I was researching the uh, history of queer Australia. As I say, particularly that early, uh, the period that begins in 69, the political period, but increasingly I've extended that beyond Australia to a kind of transnational interest. I have gone backwards, um, not much past the Second World War, but that it's enough to be getting on with, as it turns out. Uh, and also, of course, the gay and lesbian has expanded now to include a whole plethora of other kinds of identities. Um, it, in the course of sort of attending sessions around the grant scheme and what it was and what it could do, I was approached by people from Melbourne University Archives um, who suggested it might be useful to focus on their collection uh, as, as a way of dealing with, with that, that, that particular interest that I had. Uh, I knew immediately that this was a good idea. Uh, the Melbourne Uni Archives is incredibly rich in relation to queer history, and Jean's talked about uh, the Victorian Women's Liberation Lesbian Feminist Archive, which is an extraordinarily large one, as she indicates, but not by any means the extent of, the full extent, of the University Archives holdings. So they were, it was a, a a collection that I had wanted to get into for quite some time. My own interest, particular interest, I've been involved with the Australian Lesbian Gay Archives since uh, the mid-90s, when I started doing my research, actually, the PhD research. I started using the collection. I thought, well, the least I could do is kind of help out a bit. Um, and in those days, the slightest flicker of interest and you were roped onto the committee, which was the main <laughs> way. And there's no getting off the committee short of leaving the country. In fact, I tried that for a year and I was still on the committee. Um, it's a volunteer organisation. It's existed since 1978. It's um, you know, entirely self-funding and so on. But it is part of uh, a, a much broader... It's the largest such collection in Australia, by far, uh, and therefore, because we focus on Australian material, the largest such collection in the world around Australian queer history. Um, but it was something that... Um, uh, of it, we think of this, this history now, the archives and the records of the movement and the community as, as a distributed one. Most state libraries will hold material. Uh, there are community organisations such as Pride History in uh, Sydney, which collects oral histories. Uh, 
There's a Gay and Lesbian Archive of Western Australia, which I think is, again, inactive, but nonetheless, the collection there is important. Uh, and, and important materials turn up in different places, uh, including, obviously, Melbourne University Archives. So this seemed like an opportunity to get into one of those distributed collections and um, examine it a bit more closely. Homosexuality provided a good topic for the, the research for the, for the MEGS, Melbourne Engagement Grant Scheme project, uh, because in terms of the relationship between the university and the wider community, between town and gown, uh, it's not at all a one-way relationship. It's not just about the university serving the wider community or, uh, if you like, the other way around. The university is not, in fact, an ivory tower, but a place in which the social transformation, beginning in the 1960s, has played out particularly strongly. And it's very clear, has always been very clear, that there are strong interactions between university academics, conceived of both as citizens who are shaped by uh, the transformation that we've been going through and who in turn want to shape it, but also as experts, as people who have particular expertise that they can bring to public debates. That often includes demands upon them to do so. So that, for example, in the very early days, to take a topical example, same-sex marriage, it was law academics who started to think about whether that was possible legally, constitutionally, in Australia. So while the movement is often running, there's also a demand for a particular kind of input of knowledge into, into that movement. And you can multiply those examples by many, many times. Um, professional and governmental policy often relies upon or looks to university academics uh, as for, for their expertise and their guidance. Um, and of course, activists, both on and off the campuses, have played a really important role in um, the, the social transformation that we've seen over the last 50 years. For that reason, getting into this collection, this very rich collection in the Melbourne University Archives, seemed like a useful thing to be doing uh, to, to help, along, help our, our understanding because the Melbourne Uni Archives hold materials relevant to all of those different aspects of the relationship between town and gown, and getting a better sense of what there was uh, so that the existence of that material could be known to the wider community, uh, both for the benefit of the university in terms of, you know, we have always served the, the wider community, but also for the benefit of those communities outside. They get a stronger sense of their own histories. Uh, Cathy's now going to talk about main, one of the main outcomes of the project, which was the website that was produced. Okay. Um, thanks, Graham, for the introduction. Um, I, my, intro my background is actually... Um, I'm a filmmaker, documentary maker, and I'm really interested in history documentaries. Um, I have a lesbian feminist background, uh, activist over many years. These days I probably identify as queer. And um, a few years ago I um, volunteered, got roped into <laughs> being on the committee at the archives. There's no leaving. Uh, that, that is true. Um, but um, last year Graham invited me to work with him and do some research on the MEGS grant. And um, I spent a lot of time at the Ballew Library in the beautiful... Um, um, research room at the at the um, Bellu Library, and delving into uh, lots of records. So the outcome of the Megs uh, Grant uh, project, as uh, Graham has uh, just mentioned, is um, the production of an online subject guide. So you can access, you can navigate um, via the University of Melbourne uh, archives, and there's a menu on the side that you can uh, just scroll down and go to resources. You can get to it that way and go to the subject guides uh, that way and you'll see homosexuality, homosexuality in the University of Melbourne. Otherwise, if you don't go via the menu, you can just scroll down the page, the home page, and select subject guides. Uh, I haven't done this full screen, but everyone can see that fine. Yep. Um, and this photograph came out of the university um, archives. But if you select on the live link here, then you'll be taken to our five headings that we created. So Julian Phillips, Terry Stokes, um, 
Student Organisations, Victorian Women's Liberation, Lesbian Feminist Archives, and thank you, Jean, for stepping in and saving the day <laughs> earlier. Um, I, I might... Um, I'll go through just very briefly on the, each of these five topics, um, but perhaps I'll just jump into the um, uh, Victorian Women's Liberation and Lesbian Feminist Archives and show you a um, photograph of um, the Women's Liberation House. Um, and that speaks to uh, what Jean was talking about earlier. Um, so we've um, brought the, um, those archives to the foreground and into this um, subject guide. As the role of the Women's <coughs> Liberation Movement, second wave feminism was very integral to the gay liberation <coughs> movement at the time. Those two were very hand in hand and worked together. Um, so <clears throat> the navigation is fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, we've put up a, a, a bit of a description and you'll see the detail of the archive holdings. And this is the research that Graham did on Gillian Phillips. And um, there's a list of all the boxes that are available and a bit of a description of the contents of those boxes. And so that's... Um, designed as a, um, a tool. So the guide offers a, a detailed description of the material related to uh, queer histories held in the UMA. It obviously doesn't list everything. Um, it's a tool to re assist researchers, students with their topics in academics, as well as the researchers beyond the university community. Um, it's an online um, guide, and so obviously anyone can jump on and, have it, and access it. You'll also see that the, uh, and there are live links to the um, search catalogue, the university library search catalogue. Um, and there are live links to e from each of our headings. Um, so that's all of the Gillian Phillips and Graham will speak to Gillian Phillips. There's a lot of detail if you've got time to um, search through. It's very well worth delving in. Um, Graham will talk about Gillian Phillips. I'm going to talk about Terry Stokes' case, which is the research that we did for this project. And you can see there's some live links. There's a lot of crossover between the material. Um, and then there's the related records in other university, um, uh, university of Melbourne collections. And on the gay liberation movement. So there's very, very detailed uh, descriptions of what's, what's in each of these holdings. Um, and if you select this live link, that'll take you back to the catalogue, okay? So it's fairly straightforward, but um, we think it's really quite exciting. Um, and on the one of these is another really fantastic photo. We haven't included... Yeah, I think it was on this one. Anyway, um, I might swap back to, to Graham, but hopefully that's given you a little bit of a, a navigation around and an introduction to the, the subject guide. We wanted to pick a couple of case studies that we would kind of highlight the value of the work that we'd done. Um, I should say the website's not finished yet. I just found a photo of Julian Phillips recently that we can pop up there. Um, I wanted to talk about the particular... My case study was the, the case of Julian Phillips. Um, and there, thank you. Julian Phillips seen here on the right with Chris Panham, who was a Melbourne University person, law person, ended up a, a Queen's Council. Um, Julian Phillips was a law lecturer here at the university, uh, and when he died, his papers came to the university archives, as, as is often the case. They came in a rather disordered state, to put it politely, uh, which I gather was also a reflection of, a, a very accurate reflection of his life. Nonetheless, people, turned their, people at the archives turned their attention to trying to bring some sort of order to, to the material that they'd received and provide a sort of basic listing uh, of, of the eight or nine boxes that exist. 
from my point of view, the advantage of the disordered state was it, it required me to, to go looking uh, for the material that I wanted. I had been in touch with Phillips some years prior to, to this project. Um, his name was known as somebody who was somehow bound up with the decriminalisation of homosexuality in Victoria, which took place in 1980 and 81. Um, I, I can't remember how now, tracked him down, rang him up. Uh, he was just in the process of moving house, so he didn't really have time to do a proper interview. So he as it said, I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just touch on a few things. And he then talked at me for about an hour uh, while I sort of frantically took notes, which turned out to be a good thing because the next thing I heard of him was that he had died. So though we don't have an interview, we have detailed interview notes. His role, the decriminalisation of, of male homosexuality in Victoria is, was a remarkable achievement. Not because it was the first, it wasn't. South Australia and the ACT had come first. By the time it arose in the late 70s, it was already really a live issue. It just needed a kind of trigger to, to set it off. That trigger turned out to be the police um, going down to the Black Rock Beach Beat, a place where men hang out to, to pick each other for sex, sending in attractive young officers to lure men into propositioning them it was not only illegal in Victoria to commit homosexual acts, it was illegal to proposition anyone for a homosexual act, it was illegal to hang around in public on the off chance you might get a chance to proposition somebody for sex. Uh, the police decided that the Black Rock Beach Beat was a place that they should target. It was said at the time that they had trained their younger officers into the ways in which you could recognise homosexual men. The fact that they were hanging around in the tea tree Black Rock Beach didn't seem to be enough on its own. They also <laughs> needed to know things like the special walk by which we apparently identify each other. This hit the newspapers and to the horror of the police force, it wasn't the heroic defence of the beaches that was, was highlighted, it was the completely ridiculous waste of time and the kind of archaic laws that underpinned this. So suddenly in 77, an issue that had been around really for this stage by seven or eight years uh, was front page news. The Victorian government, under the then pre uh, Premier, uh, Rupert Hamer, he called himself Dick Hamer at the time, probably wouldn't anymore, um, he uh, had an Equal Opportunity Advisory Council and referred the issue off to them. OK, we're going to reform the laws, how should we do it? The head of that count committee was, in fact, um, Julian Phillips. And so in his papers, we do have, as I expected we would, uh, have a great deal of material around his uh, contribution to that process. Not just the formal report, which of course is fairly widely available, but the, 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 the working papers and the stuff that he did and the discussions of his organisation <coughs> as they tried to work out what to do. In talking to Phillips, I, I had come to understand how it was that Victoria got what was described at the time as the best homosexual law reform law uh, anywhere in the English-speaking world, which I don't know who was more surprised by this, the Christian right or the radicals, but it was, in fact, a very good law reform. Equal age of consent, um, completely stripped out any reference to homosexuality, heterosexuality, all sexual acts were the same in the, in the eyes of the law, so, and, and a kind of sliding scale. There wasn't an absolute age of consent. Below the absolute age of consent, if your partner was no more than two years older than you, then it was, or younger, uh, it, was, um, it was legal. And this was a way around the problem to which particularly young women affected not by homosexual laws but by um, sort of sexual morality laws that they had been locked up for, for being in moral danger. And, and this law was intended to wipe that out, that in fact if you're just engaged in the kind of normal sexual behaviour of teenagers, you're not going to be locked up. And this applied to homosexual acts as well. It was an extraordinary thing, really. Um, and so I wanted to kind of examine a bit more what he had told me to see what records I could find of the trip to Scandinavia that he said was, uh, had been such an important part of his, his thinking about these issues. As is often the case, going through the material, because it was so disordered, I, you know, I couldn't just pull out the folder that said homosexual law reform, for example, or indecent acts or whatever. I had to kind of go through everything just to make sure. And in the course of doing this, I stumbled across something which, as far as I know, nobody has ever heard of since, uh, which is the existence of a Victorian transsexual coalition. 
which in 1982-1983 was in communication with the Equal Opportunity Advisory Committee, um, talking to them about whether the then emerging interest in anti-discrimination laws, so we've moved on from decriminalisation into anti-discrimination and whether or not homosexuals ought to be covered by that, and suddenly a group of, of uh, women describing themselves as transsexuals, not a word that we would use very easily these days, approached Phillips to get him to think about whether um, the interest in anti-discrimination laws that was going on could in fact be applied to them. They identified many of the ways in which it would be relevant to them, that they did in fact, in fact uh, experience discrimination, and they listed the areas as birth certificates, passports, marriage, discrimination on the grounds of sex, social security benefits, the law in relation to rape and sexual assault, the cost of what they call the operation, and Medicare. So we have really, long before we had any real sense of this being an issue, a, a recognition, a, a political interest in the issues uh, of, uh, of discrimination as it is actually experienced by a group of um, transsexual women. The coalition has a letterhead, which as luck have it, has it survives, you know, when they, when they wrote to him, and they talk about the way in which it is composed of members of the transsexual community, assisted by the Queen Victoria Medical Centre, which is where most of the surgery took place, Commonwealth Rehabilitation Service, Department of Employment and Youth Affairs, Committee of Self-Help Groups, Social Biology Resources Centre, Lifeline and Supporting Churches. The Department of Employment and Youth Affairs is interesting. Clearly, at this point, there's a Commonwealth agency, Commonwealth Department, that is interested in the issues around transsexuality and are prepared to have their name listed as and to be, in some sense, form or part of this coalition. Uh, I haven't yet been able to find out anything more about this at all. I've started asking around amongst older trans people and I haven't yet found anybody who remembers it. But it is a really important example, I think, uh, it's, it's evidence that the issues are being raised in a way that we hadn't previously realised that they were being raised this early. And it's a way of seeing, I think, the, the broader interest of this project, which is how is that the university, and the fact that Phillips is at the university, he's easily findable, means that people can use the university as a resource to help them to advance their particular political agendas. Um, so in that case, the, the Phillips example and the uh, it's a really interesting example of what you can find. You can find what you're looking for. You can find stuff that you didn't know even existed. So basically we've got the Julian Phillips, who's the lawyer, and um, Terry Stokes, uh, who was the young gay philosophy student who, who suffers discrimination. And then we looked at student organisations, um, the Victorian Women's Liberation and Feminist Archive and the related records in the University of Melbourne. Um, so it does take a long time to change laws, to shift attitudes, and the LGBTIQ histories have a history of mainstream in institutional neglect. So this subject guide um, makes a, a small contribution to rep reparation, but just to get down into the Terry Stokes case, um, I delved into all of the records and found a lot of the correspondence, and there is a lot, around his case. So, uh, in brief, on Saturday, the 8th of October, 1979, uh, Terry and Darren are arrested and charged for kissing in public under the Summary, Summary Offences Act. Um, he goes, Terry, um, Terry goes to court and is fined $70. Uh, the university issues a notice for him to vacate his lodgings at graduate, graduate house within seven days, the day after his court case. He's evicted from great because he was. Uh, I don't know if many of you here know that uh, the university has a, um, a student residence at Graduate's House. So he's issued a, a notice to vacate. Terry appeals, and on his behalf, Julian Phillips writes to the um, acting um, vice chancellor, and Julian argues that it's a denial of natural justice and infringement of civil, liberty, civil liberties. So students are outraged on campus and there's a very quickly um, a demonstration organised, a kissing protest <laughs> at the, Australia, the Hotel Australia in Collins Street, um, which is where um, Darren and uh, Terry were arrested at the Woolshed Bar. Um, 
And this was the photograph that was in, appeared in The Age the next day. Um, this is a photograph care of uh, James Spence and it's held in the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives. And um, I think that that's a fabulous image that really um, speaks to the kind of standoff between the security from the hotel and the protesters, protesters out the front. Um, the Farago student newspaper um, gets on board and writes an article. And um, then there's an, uh, the Graduate House Board calls a, um, a, a, a special meeting to hear Terry Stokes' appeal on the 18th of October. So this is all a very concentrated few weeks of time. And there's statements from the assistant warden at, at Graduate House, um, Barbara Funder, and uh, also the uh, warden, um, Warden Berry. They had quite different ideas about why Terry should be evicted, uh, which is kind of interesting in itself. Um, the ABC Radio interviewed Warden Berry and he uh, went on, on record with saying that it was uh, Terry's homosexuality that had upset people. So he was quite strong in that view. Barbara wasn't quite so strong. She thought that he was just... Um, he, was, he had a visitor that night and that was contravening uh, graduate house rules, which wasn't quite uh, the case from Terry's point of view. In any case, the decision was the board reverses the decision, but in the meantime, Terry had actually been required to leave Graduate House. So by the time the, um, the meeting is held and the decision is reversed, he's already made other arrangements off campus. And so he wrote to um, Warden Berry advising that he won't be returning to Graduate House. Um, although he, I think he felt vindicated in the end. And I did speak to Terry. Um, so Julian Phillips went to the appeal meeting and spoke on behalf of Terry. And um, in a conversation that I had with um, Terry recently, he said that Julian's eloquence and uh, persuasive influence at the appeal was um, very helpful. But just to conclude, I guess um, I wanted to say uh, from a lesbian feminist and um, point of view that historically gay law reform has mostly affected gay men um, because their acts of desire were criminalised. The offensive behaviour, however, the, the offensive behaviour law did apply, however, to gay men and lesbians, but it was mainly gay men who were charged. Lesbian sex practices and lesbian desire has never been criminalised but there are many ways that lesbians suffer punitive social discipline. And I just wanted to mention that, for example, um, particularly back in the 1970s, lesbian feminist women who challenged the traditional heteronormative family structure um, often had to fight for the custody of their children and many lost custody of their children. And it was male-dominated courts who uh, judged them to be unfit mothers. I guess that I'm, I'm mentioning that because in this research, um, the gay law reform uh, issue really did focus on, on the uh, men's stories, the gay men's stories. But I think that this project really shows that intimacy, sexuality, love and activism are all areas of experience that are difficult to chronicle through, through the materials of a traditional archive. And understanding the emotions of queer stories helps to explain the queerness, I think, and the idiosyncrasies of LGBTI uh, histories. And I guess the value of the archives is that they offer a window into stories and lived experience that we might not otherwise have access to. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is really just a comment. It's Gavin McCarthy here. I met Terry in 1985 when I joined the Department of History and Philosophy of Science and I sort of kept track of him until about 2000 and the only comment I'd like to make, and I was so glad to hear that you'd been in touch with him because that's what I was thinking, you know, because I'd lost touch with him, uh, but he would be so glad to know that the Australian Society of Archivists has a special interest group on single malt whiskies, <laughs> which was very much a tradition in HPS in the, the 80s and the 90s, so... Hi. Oh, just actually, just a comment. Just um, how uh, you know how um, today we're sort of 
back in, it, you know, it's almost as if we're back in this time. Obviously, it's not as bad, but you know, we we're now doing this stupid blooming, uh, you know, non-binding postal survey and that kind of thing. And it's like how frustrating it must be for those that went through this first wave, you know, and of things like you know, feminism and gay liberation to see everything just torn down again. Um, to, you know, people that lived in Tasmania when they were decriminalising homosexuality there, which wasn't that long ago, um, to now see that we're back in the same place where um, bigots have been basically given a platform. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's just, I mean, that was really just a comment and just, you know, um, you know, and a thanks for, you know, getting the history out there. Hi. Um, the um, director of the Digital Transgender Archive in the States, KJ Rawson, published an article um, last month um, about the role of archival description um, in constructing identity. And um, you made a couple of com comments, both of you, um, in that talk um, that, that spoke to this, I think. So um, you talked about the, the use of the term transsexual, that um, in the 80s, that, that was a perfectly acceptable term, but that now we, we think of that as um, somewhat offensive. Um, and Kathy, you mentioned that you um, use different terms to describe your own identity now than you used in the past. And so I wondered whether you had come across any challenges in how you go about describing archival materials, whether um, there were any, any terms that um, you, uh, whether you had to make any decisions around using terms that were historically accurate at, at the time, but that users might not consider searching on when they're using finding aids, for example, um, or whether there were terms that uh, you, you think would be useful for searching, but that would be um, considered anachronistic, historically speaking. I was going to say that I had a discussion with students last year about whether trans should have an asterisk on it or not. Um, they were convinced there was a consensus that it should not. I had used a slide that said that it showed that it did in particular cases. There is no consensus. There can't be a consensus. There's no authoritative body to pick up on this stuff. You're right. And the real issue is around searching. And then I think you just use as many key words as you can think of. So, of course, we talk about the transsexual coalition because that's what they call themselves. But if we had key words and tags and stuff, you would use that but as the name of the organisation, but also subsequent terms um, that have been used now. But of course it will change. You know, I remember in the 90s, trannies was the preferred term. Um, you probably wouldn't use that now. Um, and it will be different in five years again. You just have to kind of live with that fact, I think. Um, and try to be sensitive and try to be inclusive. Well, not to be sensitive, only. Try, not to try, but to do um, those things. It just means using more keystrokes. And just using more words. I mean, it is true though that if you, depending on the word that you type into the search catalogue, then that will return you particular numbers of hits, I suppose, on, on that, that word. And I think that changes at different times. So um, I, I think we're going to need to move on. I'd really like to thank uh, Cathy and Graham again. And Helen Morgan speaking about uh, her story and um, well, putting the her back in history. And it's based on uh, a, a large amount of work and uh, projects that both Helen and Nikki have been involved in at the Scholarship Research Centre and in their own research mm -hmm. um, over a number of years. And uh, Helen, tell us more about that. Okay, so I'd like to join... Um, my, my other presenters in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and paying respects to their elders, past, present and future. And I'd also like, I guess, you know, I've got the mic, ha ha. Um, I'd like to, um, as a straight, middle class, white woman who nearly gets sort of the, the quintet of... Um, you know, privilege, just need the Y chromosome. I'd just like to say we have we have your back, all your uh, all 
LGBTQI um, friends in here. I just, this latest perversion of democracy is really getting up my goat. I'm keeping a file and they will be held accountable at some stage. So, <laughs> um, so four weeks ago on the 23rd of August, Victorian ALP MP Fiona Richardson passed away only a day after she, as Minister for Women and Prevention of Domestic Violence, announced her retirement from politics because her recovery from cancer treatment wasn't going the way she had planned. In her passing, and as was fitting and expected, Richardson was remembered and memorialised for her role in bringing attention to the extent of the scourge of domestic violence in Victoria, along with setting the legislative agenda for measures to combat it. As Premier Daniel Andrews observed, under her watch, a dark and silent tragedy was brought into the harsh and unforgiving light of a royal commission. And the 2,000 pages of that commission's final report are her greatest legacy to public life. How fitting that he noted that creating records was her most important legacy. Because Richardson herself was also keenly aware that records, archives, collections, be they archival or museum-based, are vital to creating public narratives that encourage equity and social justice. In particular, Richardson was keenly supportive of the Her Place Women's Museum Australia initiative. She launched Her Place's first pop-up exhibition and presaging recent debates on International Day Women's Day this year, she wrote, the lack of women represented in our statues and public spaces show how we fail to recognise, respect and pay tribute to women's achievements. It shows women are not expected to take up their equal share of public space. This is why in the Victorian State Government's gender equity strategy announced in 2016, increasing the visibility of women in our cultural heritage institutions was included as an important plank in improving gender equality measures. Funding to extend the task of publicly recognising Australian women's historical contributions was committed as part of that strategy. Now, most of the public interest in her place has focused on the museum project, so the work at board level and behind the scenes of the archivists in the room, which includes staff and friends of the Australian Women's Register and the Australian Women's Archives Project, has not been acknowledged to any great extent. So we'd like to take this opportunity to reinforce the role of archives and archivists working in collaboration with historians and other glam professionals to the creation of important political projects. Even when they don't have a lot of money to play with, archivists can still do something. The Australian Women's Archives Project, or as we abbreviate AWOP, has now been actively creating and sharing feminist knowledge for more than 17 years, mainly through the Australian Women's Register as, as its flagship project. The register documents a complex contextual network of Australian women and their archival and bibliographic resources. A network visualisation of the Women in Leadership project is the basis for this conference's logo. Where notable gaps have been identified, new records have been created through oral history programs and archival research published in themed exhibitions linked to the register. Filling these gaps in the record often represents what has been termed in a more journalistic sense, the first draft of, the first draft of history, because they represent the first publicly accessible published biographical accounts of the women involved. The authority of the register and our expertise in the area of online data curation has been recognised by the state government in our involvement in the Her Place project, but also in many successful partnerships in Australian Research Council funded projects, Australian Women in Leadership, the Trailblazing Women in the Law, and most recently, the Invisible Farmer projects. Now, for detailed examinations of the Australian Women's Archives Project and the Australian Women's Register, we direct you to these recent articles in the Australian Library Journal and Australian Feminist Studies. But now we'd like to present some observations from our, um, some of our more recent activities. So because the Register has always been housed in the eScholarship Research Centre, so within an academic context, 
We have been fortunate to have been involved in several Australian Research Council funded projects over the journey. They all feature making biographical, bibliographical and archival metadata about the women being researched publicly available via the register, ensuring that the research output becomes infrastructure to support further research. For instance, a project funded by a non-government phil philanthropic organisation, Brilliant Ideas and Huge Visions, um, which I was actually told by a farm woman, it's all wrong, but anyway, you know. Um, <laughs> an exhibition documenting the achievements of Australian Rural Women of the Year since 1994, provided the platform for a recent successful application to the Australian Research Council. Um, uh, its linkage program. The Invisible Farmer, Securing Australian Farm Women's History, funded in 2016, is a collaborative project involving partners from government, academia, media, collecting, uh, collecting institutions and grassroots feminist organisations to collect, document and publish online the history of Australian farm and fisherwomen. The information infrastructure created by the Register in the Brilliant Ideas and Huge Visions project informed the application for funding for this work in progress. Now many of our research, uh, Australian Research Council funded projects involve an oral history component. We are in effect working with women to create archival records that will be curated most, more often than not by the National Library of Australia. For instance, this direct engagement with the subject and the creation of an oral history archive drove the Trailblazing Women in the Law Project, the first national study of Australian women lawyers, many of whom were firsts in their field. 45 specially commissioned oral history interviews were conducted and these interviews provided the key archival resource lodged with the National Library. Data from these interviews then formed the basis for many biographical entries published in the register online. An important outcome of the Lawyers Project has been an online exhibition featuring 500 women lawyers. That's 500, which we think is not a bad effort in three years of research. Many of the biographical entries were written in collaboration with the women themselves um, who were represented, including several written entirely by the women themselves. Without having ever used the term to describe our approach, we suspect we have always operated with um, what feminist and ar activist archivists Michelle Caswell and Marika Sifo have termed a feminist ethics of care, adopting radical empathy as a model to guide archivists and archival scholars in addressing social justice concerns. This ethics, they argue, is built around notions of relationality, interdependence, embodiment and responsibility to others, having the potential to be a more inclusive and apt model for envisioning and enacting a more just society than a legalistic rights-based framework. They advocate that a feminist archival ethic shifts four key archival relationships between archivists and record creators subjects, users and communities, involving all these categories in the process. In so doing, they observe the crucial importance of publicly voicing what is often kept silence in the shaping of archives, namely the numerous micro and macro decisions made in appraisal and representation. Now we don't have the time to describe each and every way we employ this ethics, ethics of care in the register and we do explore that in the Australian Feminist Studies article. So today we'll limit our discussion to what we regard as our most important effective responsibility, the relationship between us as archivists and the people we interview or collaborate with as writers, the record creators. Although a born digital non-custodial project, AWOP project workers are not removed from the creators of archives, nor are we unaffected by our relationships with them. The word archive in our title has sometimes created expectation in the minds of women desperate to see their records preserved by someone, anyone. On more than one occasion, project officers have arrived at speaking events to be presented with boxes and bags of records by attendees who are anxious to have their papers preserved and happy to pass on the, or rather, not happy to pass, well, 
happy to pass on the responsibility of those records to somebody else. And I've had that only in the last week, um, doing an interview with somebody. Um, so these records often date back 20 to 30 years and mainly document the creator's involvement in an organisation. And they're often kitchen table organisations. They're places without an office and a, you know, a, um, a filing cabinet. Many of these creators feel burdened by them. They know they're important, um, and they're important because they are documents of Australian women's activism, but they fear that those who weren't there when the records were created will not recognise this, especially their children, quite frankly, after their mother's death. To be told by a women's archives project that they potentially carry important historical stories becomes important vindication of their lives. It also makes them very anxious about finding a resting spot for them. So in 2011, I met with women who had been instrumental in establishing the Australian Women in Agriculture movement to talk about the Brilliant Ideas and Huge Visions exhibition. So the venue was in a country town in northeastern Victoria. Um, it was actually Cathy McGowan's house. And there were about 25 women there who'd driven from all around the district to hear about the project. I left with six boxes of material I had not expected to receive. Um, records of the formative years of Australian women in agriculture and the women on farms gatherings. On the one hand, it was wonderful to know that these papers um, had been temporarily saved, as one donor put it, from the bonfire her children would have lit. On the other hand, I felt guilty and somewhat helpless as I took them. Um, I had neither the space to keep them personally nor the resources to properly assess and accession them. And they were living on, in our attic. My husband, who has a better back than I, has moved them at least three times in the last five years. So it was, it was a problem and I felt incredibly anxious about them. Uh, and this wasn't helped at all by the regular phone calls from one of the donors wondering why they hadn't been catalogued yet. Um, indicating that once gone, the papers weren't forgotten. She may have handed them up, but she still had a, a view that they were useful. So this material was given away not only with preservation in, in mind, but reuse. In general times, though, who does have space or resource to take new material these days? Not even the major repositories, or perhaps more correctly, especially not the major repositories can help these days. Um, the AWOP provides a solution through its distributed non-custodial network model to register material in private hands. The problem is many women can't handle the responsibility of that material in private hands. Happily, the AWOP has brokered the transfer of some of the records of Victorian women on farms to national repositories. But for every successful transfer, we have multiple examples of where we cannot help. The next step in a post-custodial solution could involve disclosing the existence of these records at risk and throwing it open to the community to come up with creative solutions. It might also put pressure on collecting institutions to better explain and justify their, their appraisal decisions, or indeed be a mechanism where those processes are opened up to more community engagement. I mean, and you will be pleased to know that um, the, these papers were, in fact, described um, by wonderful Wynne in the eScholarship Research Centre, so that they, people can actually use them now. There is a description, but that was probably, probably because we had an ARC fund that we were able to do that. They would still be sitting on, in my office um, undescribed. Okay, moving away from discussions of physical records, our most carefully crafted relationships are with living women who offer material either in text or as oral history. Because our funding has promoted the exhibition-based publication model, often in partnership with the National Library of Australia Oral History and Folklore section, we find ourselves frequently in the position of co-curator of that first draft of history when we write our biographical entries about women featured in our exhibitions. The most recent exhibition, uh, the Lawyers Exhibition, offers many examples of this co-curation of biographical data, including examples where women have requ requested changes to their record despite already having approved their first drafts. So we do have an, an, a way of dealing with, with change in a, in a way that actually involves a sense of context and how 
a woman's life context will change and how they may want to have things re-described. So personal obligation to take records, create data and publish stories is the feminist commitment of the archivists, historians and community representatives who work on the AWOP project. This sense of personal responsibility has ensured the project's longevity. It's been on the wall <laughs> several times, but because we feel it's important and it does serve a political process, regardless of how imperfect it may be, we've managed to keep alive and keep afloat. And in fact, it's probably at its strongest point ever now because of that personal commitment. Of necessity by intent, collaboration and increasingly co-curation have been really important factors in keeping the project going. So these examples from the AWOP experience illustrate again, as Caswell and Kiefer have described it, the complicated navigation of the desires and needs of record creators. The personal obligation to take records and work towards finding them a suitable archival home, along with proactively but sensitively documenting women's lives and their achievements so that the value of their records are more easily recognised, form part of the feminist commitment of these archivists, historians and community representatives. This sense of personal responsibility and radical empathy has in turn ensured the project's longevity. We are all willing to listen and learn, evolving policies, practices and technical systems that embody mutually respectful relationships and challenge the power differentials built into existing archival and historical processes and systems. AWOP embraces projects which feature collaboration and co-curation, building communities of people and records that go beyond cataloguing and collecting to tell her story. Thank you. Thank you to Nikki and Helen. Who has a question or a comment? Hi. Um, so I was wondering about, do you see prospects of, I don't know, vast amounts of money coming away to set up a kind of, some way of collect, like somewhere to store all this stuff in an accessible way? Well, a board member of the Her Place um, project, Hel Helen's on the board. I'm no longer on it because I'm just kind of shitty, but that's... That's what the, yeah. the, the Her Place Women's <laughs> Museum Australia, which is uh, um, just been functioning for about the last 12 months, uh, along with Pat Grimshaw, who I know many of you will know, um, a group of us archivists and historians have got involved with the museum saying that an important thing is that you've mm. got to have somewhere to keep the records. So we are keeping agitating for there to be a physical space. I'd really like a women's only space. I'd like a women's library and I want all these things. Mm. We're just now trying to hit up the philanthropists to give us the money to do mm. it. But that a space for the archives is very much on the agenda because, you know, uh, to, I mean, if we're going to be honest about it, the focus has been on the museum and the stuff that people can see. And so we have to keep just banging on about this is all, this won't mean, may mean anything unless there's the undercurrent. And so the, sh the, long, the short answer is there's nothing yet. But we have hopes. That's, yeah. that's, why, we're, that's <laughs> why we're involved. Yeah, yeah. We're agitating for space. These are the calendars that I mentioned. They're, they're just one of the calendars that we did. If anybody's interested, they're free. You can just come and take one. Just gives a bit of an overview of the women's liberation movement from. Well, we need one for the archives. Yeah. I know you've got your own archives, but we've got our archives. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well thanks uh, for everyone for bearing with us through the technical issues. I'd like to thank Nikki and Helen again. And